incomplete. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the half. And wow, what a half it's been. I guarantee you nobody saw this coming as the team does not look like themselves. They started off strong, but just couldn't keep up. They may have had a strategy coming in, but it's obviously not working. But there's plenty of time to turn things around. It's only halftime. You just hope a new team comes out after the half with a better plan. So it's back to the drawing board if they want to have a chance of coming away with a victory. The head coach needs to make some adjustments and make them fast because they are not on the same page. And we'll get back to the action after halftime. Well, today we are a few minutes from halftime being over and we're about to walk out into the second half of the year. And as we do that, on behalf of all of us at Gwinnett Church, Sugar Hill and Gwinnett Church Hamilton Mill, I wanna say how, what a privilege it's been for Redstone Church in Birmingham and Decatur City Church and Southside Church, Henry County, Peachtree City, Noonan and Sarah B to join us. And if you're new at any of our campuses today, what we've been doing over the last couple of weeks is kind of reflecting on the first half of the year and like any good coach or team would do, try to make some halftime adjustments so that we could finish the second half of the year strong because kind of the premise of this whole series is it's not too late to finish this year strong. And so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna look at a halftime adjustment that, that I think if we make this adjustment, it's an amazing invitation, it's an incredible opportunity, and I think it can make a significant difference in the second half of the year. Now, to illustrate and introduce what this halftime adjustment is, I wanna take you back and take us back 50 years ago. 50 years ago this month, in fact. I believe what happened 50 years ago this month was, one of, without a doubt, one of the most remarkable achievements in human history, and that is when Apollo 11 landed on the moon and Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon. And that was 50 years ago, and I was four years old at the time. And even though I was still a young guy, I have vivid memories of that moment. And one of the memories, and this is, this is rarely ever happened, is you can actually walk out and look at the moon and know that there are people up there walking on the moon. And I would walk inside to our black and white television and actually watch it. So what I would do as a kid is I would run out to the moon and then I would run back inside. I'd run up to the moon and I mean, run out to the moon and run back inside. And I would think, oh my goodness, there are, there are men on the moon. And so I asked my dad, dad, if I go outside and I, and I screamed really loud, do you think the astronauts could hear me and I could talk to them? And my dad looked at me and I know what he was thinking. He was thinking, oh no, my son is not very bright. So, <laughs> and he was right about that, by the way. But he smiled and he said, well, let me think about that. So a few minutes later, my dad came up to me and said, son, let's, let's, let's try this. Let's go outside and let's talk to the astronauts to see if they can hear you. So I thought, this is great, this is awesome. So I walked outside, there's the moon, and I knew there were two men walking on the moon. And so I, I, he said, my dad said, well, let's, let's go, let's try this. So I said, hello, Mr. Armstrong and Mr. Aldrin. Nothing. And so my dad said, well, son, you know, it's a long way from Atlanta to the moon, so you're gonna have to yell louder than that. I don't think they heard you. I said, okay. So, and as all of my strength as a four-year-old, I said, hello, Mr. Armstrong and Mr. Aldrin. And a few minutes later, I heard this. Hello down there, Jeff. It worked. <laughs> Imagine that. Now, the conversation was brief because it wasn't part of their flight plan to talk to a four-year-old in Atlanta, Georgia. And it was also a little weird that they, the astronaut said I needed to eat more vegetables. But other than that, <laughs> this was an extraordinary opportunity, right? Now, I would later discover that what really happened, my dad went and got a ladder and then he asked my older brother, who's seven years older than me, to climb up the ladder and sit on the roof, all right? So my brother played the uh, part of Neil Armstrong in Buzz Aldrin. And when I later learned this, I was, I was pretty disappointed. I, I don't know how old I was, I think maybe 25 or 26 years old <laughs> when I finally realized this. And, and, and it was just kinda, oh no, you mean I really didn't talk to, to the astronauts? But, but I want you to catch the image for just a moment. Uh, of a little boy saying words that float up to the heavens, hoping to get an answer back. And as silly as that image and illustration may be, that actually illustrates something that's really pivotal in the life of anyone who wants to follow Jesus. It's called, and you've been around church, you've seen this, you've heard this, it's called prayer. 
And prayer is this kind of mysterious thing where you can say words and kind of float up to heaven or you write a journal and these words can kind of float up to heaven. And, and, and our hope and our belief is that God hears those words. God hears those things we write down. God hears our prayers and our hope is that he would answer. And that's a really pivotal thing to talk about. But my experience when it comes to prayer, I've been around church world all my life, and typically, not everyone, but generally speaking, there's this low grade level of guilt or disappointment in our prayer life. And it sounds something like this. We think, you know, I know I should pray more and I don't. And I bet God is disappointed in my prayer life. I bet God is disappointed that I don't pray more consistently. So there's this low, low grade level of disappointment. And then we wonder things like this. I wonder if God noticed that I fell asleep that time when I prayed. I wonder if God noticed that when I was praying, my mind drifted and I started to wonder if Georgia will win the national championship in the college football season. I wonder, asking for a friend. So, so what happens in these moments is we just don't feel that great about our prayer life. I don't think I've ever heard in my over 50, I mean, my over 50 years of being in church, what I've never heard anybody say, you know what's happening right now? I am crushing my prayer life right now. That's never <laughs> happened. It's, it's like, oh, I know I should pray more and God's disappointed in me and I'm just not super spiritual enough and I'm not disciplined enough. And so as a result of this, we approach prayer very similarly to how we approach broccoli and kale. We know we should eat more broccoli and kale because that's good for you. But when it comes to kale, at least, you know, four days after kale and, and the fifth day, you're like, kale, no, I'm done with kale. <laughs> Give me the waffle fries, okay? So, so what happens is that moment is we think, I'm just not disciplined enough, I'm not spiritual enough, and we carry this kind of limp around with us like, ah, oh, when it comes to prayer, I know, I know, I know, I'm just not very good at this. And then what happens in that moment is we bump into verses like this. First Thessalonians chapter five says this, pray without ceasing. So if we didn't feel bad enough, then here's the apostle Paul that says, hey, here's the deal. You should pray without ceasing and never, ever stop. And so we see verses like this. We already don't really feel that good about our prayer life. We see verses like this and think it's impossible. This is only for, I guess, people who are professional Christians, um, people that, that just don't have anything else to do. And we, we would come to this verse, and with all due respect to the Apostle Paul, we would say this, hey, I'd, I'd love to do this, but I start back in school in a few days. Hey, I would love to do this, but, but I, I have a job. I have financial obligations. Hey, I would love to do this, but I got kids to raise. I have a, a, a relationship, a spouse. I have aging parents. I don't even know how to do this. This doesn't seem realistic. And so as a result of this, this amazing opportunity called prayer is something that, again, there's this low-grade level of guilt and disappointment, and how does this even work? And so what I wanna do today is, if I can, I kinda wanna remove all that. And I want you to see this from the perspective of your Savior. I want you to see this from your perspective of your Heavenly Father. I want you to see this as an extraordinary invitation. I want you to get excited about this. More excitement more passion and less guilt and less disappointment. Because what we're gonna discover, there's actually a way to do this. But the question I wanna lead us through as we make this final halftime adjustment and then we all go into the second half of the year, here's the question I wanna answer for us today at all of our churches. What would happen? What would happen if we prayed more in the second half than we did in the first half of the year? There's an answer to this and you're gonna see this. But what would happen if you and I prayed more in the second half than in the first half? What would happen if we saw this as an incredible opportunity that we could actually say words out loud and imagine this, the creator of the universe listens to you. Do you know what that means for you? Through Jesus, you have amazing connections. And this is an incredible opportunity for the second half of the year. Now, not trying to guilt anybody, but if we were to look at our first half of the year and go, you know what, it just wasn't, I just wasn't really there in terms of my prayer life. What we're gonna talk about today is to do two things. And these are two halftime adjustments as it relates to your prayer life. And when we do this, I think it's gonna be an extraordinary answer and gift and what we're gonna look at to this question. So here are the two things I wanna talk about that will allow us, I think, to help us pray more. The first thing is simply, how do we pray more? How do we do this? How do we even pray without ceasing? How does that even work? We're gonna talk about that. And then once we figure that out, we're gonna talk about what to say when you 
pray. Maybe you've been to our churches before. Maybe this is your first time back in church for a long time. You've heard about prayer. You know, you, 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 you've seen it. You've seen it modeled, but you're like, I don't even know how to do that. Well, here's what you're gonna discover. It's not complicated. Here's what you're gonna discover. You don't have to be anybody else than who you are. And here's even great, greater news. You can bring who you really are and what's really going on to your heavenly father and have a conversation with him. And he will listen to you. So how do we do all this? Well, the first thing I wanna do is talk about how do we pray more? And so I wanna go back to this verse because again, the interesting thing about 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, this isn't even a complete sentence. That it really is a sentence, 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, 17, and 18 is the complete sentence. The complete sentence says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. But the people that came up with the chapter breaks and the verses, they pulled this out and made it its own verse. And so again, you look at this and you're like, I, I can't do this. I've got school, I've got work, I've got kids, I've got this, I've got that. This doesn't make any sense as it relates to how busy I am. But when you understand what Paul is saying, you begin to understand the invitation it is from your heavenly father to you and me. And so for us to really understand this and for us to really understand that this isn't uh, an invitation that's not aware of the busyness in your life, here's what we have to understand. We have to understand what he means by these two words. And when we understand that what he means by these two words, here's the incredible news. It unlocks a rather intimidating verse and makes it less intimidating and more inviting. So what is Paul saying here? Well, this word written in the original language of the New Testament Greek is this word right here, adalieptos. And when we understand what this word means, it really helps us understand 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Let me tell you what it doesn't mean, and let me tell you what it does mean. It doesn't mean this. Adalieptos doesn't mean nonstop. What it means is constantly recurring. That's a two, there's two big differences there. It doesn't mean you can't go to work. It doesn't mean you can't go to school. It doesn't mean you can't have a career or this or that. By the way, Paul was a businessman. He was a tent maker. So he had a job and he also helped launch churches. So what Paul is saying, I'm not saying don't stop. I'm saying constantly recurring prayer. So one of the ways to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 is to think of it this way. Pray in a constantly recurring way. That's one of our bottom lines today. Pray in a constantly recurring way. So as you and I are going on in our lives, we're able to bump into things, reminders that cause us and remind us to pray more. Now to do that, I have this phrase that, 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 that I like that it kind of helps me, and that is prayer triggers. Prayer triggers. And what is a prayer trigger? Well, a prayer trigger helps me do this. Prayer triggers are reminders to pray in a constantly recurring way so that as I'm going around in my life, I'm bumping into these reminders that remind me, pray more, pray more, pray more. And when I set these things in my life, I bump into them and they cause me to pray more. And these prayer triggers are helpful because left to my own intentions, this will be really disappointing for going at church, left to my own intentions, I might not, my default may not be to pray. Sometimes it may be to take on worry and stress and anxiety. So when I set up constant reminders and prayer triggers as I'm going through my life, it reminds me, pray about this, pray about this, pray about this. And so what I wanna do is I wanna invite you into some very specific prayer triggers so that when you go, here's my here's my. My, my hunch today. I believe if you'll set up these prayer triggers, they will cause us to pray more in the second half than quite possibly you did in the first half. And the reason that's important is our question today, what would happen if we prayed more in the second half than we did in the first half? So let me give you three examples of what a prayer trigger looks like. I really get this from a passage in the Old Testament from the book of Psalms, Psalm 55. Psalm 55 talks about a tr prayer trigger in, in, in so many words. It says this, the writer of Psalm 55 says, but I call to God and the Lord saves me. Let me just call a time out here. What the writer of this, this, this Psalm is saying is you can call to God, hello God. And through Jesus, as I mentioned earlier, he will listen to you. All we're saying today is what if we called on God more in the second half? than we did the first. 
So what would that look like? Well, according to the writer of Psalm 55, he says, evening, morning, and noon. It's a prayer trigger, by the way. Evening, morning, and noon. I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. So there's evening, that's a prayer trigger. There's morning, oh, it's morning, and it's noon, it's a prayer trigger. So let me show you how this works. So a prayer trigger for you may be morning, noon, and night. But specifically, I wanna give us a very practical way to do this, all right? Now, you don't have to do this, but I think it's a very helpful way for you to be reminded, pray more, pray more. Pray in a constantly recurring way. Julia Kozlowski, who's interning with us, uh, she was sharing with me an app called the Echo Prayer app, the Echo Prayer app. And what you can do here, you can download this app for free and you can set up a time to pray in the morning and it texts you and says, all right, here's what you wanted to pray for at whatever time that you get up. And then at noon, it texts you and says, here's what you wanted to pray for at noon. And then you set up a time at night and it texts you, here's what you said you wanted to pray for at night. Morning, noon, and night, Psalm 55. And so what I've done and what I'm encouraging you to do is download this and set up some prayer triggers so that it reminds you, oh, oh, yeah, that's right. I said I wanted to pray about that. And here's, what I, here's the premise again. Without this kind of intentional system, we're left to our own devices. Let's not go there in the second half. Let's set up some intentional prayer triggers. I have a prayer trigger that this thing texts me in the morning an intentional prayer trigger that's, that texts me in the, in the noon, an intentional prayer trigger that texts me at night. And I believe just by doing this, I'm gonna pray more in the second half than I did in the first. So morning, noon, and night. The second prayer trigger is what I simply call places. There are places in your life and my life that should trigger us to pray more. And it doesn't have to be a huge vacation spot. It can be in the normal routine of your everyday life. Let me give you an example from my world. Here, those of you that aren't going at church, uh, here at Sugar Hill, we built this initial building that I'm at right now, and then a couple of years ago, we built our student building. And there's a walkway between this building and the student building. And when I would walk back and forth, if I, was, if I was over here and I had to get to a meeting, I would walk over there, and I know that you've never done this, but as I walked over there, I would actually get off my phone and be on my phone the entire time. I know you don't do that, but that was just me. And so I remember, I was, as I was walking over there with my phone, I thought, wait, I walk back and forth between these two buildings all the time. What if instead getting out my phone, I used this as a prayer trigger, kept my phone in my pocket and just prayed? How much more would I pray if just that walk, I just decided to pray on that walk? So a few months ago, I got in front of our team, our staff, and I said, hey, I want you to hold me accountable. Anytime you see me walking between these two buildings with my phone out, I want you to remind me, That's, this is a prayer trigger for me. Don't do that. Use that walk as a time to pray. What would a place like that look like for you, for our students? It could be as you're walking into school. For parents, it could be as you're dropping kids off or, or going to the practices. For at work, it could be as you walk out of your car and into the place of business, just using that time as a prayer trigger to pray more in the second half than maybe you did in the first. So there's morning, noon, and night. There are places. And then the third is cell phones. And I know it sounds like I've been beating up on technology this, this, this series, but this is an opportunity for us to actually leverage technology through the prayer app and through the wallpaper of your cell phone. So later today at all of our churches on our Insta story feed, you're gonna get this wallpaper. And what I want you to do for just five days, let's just go, you know, from Monday through Friday, I want you to use this as your wallpaper on your phone. So you'll take a screenshot of it, you'll download it, and you'll put it on the wallpaper. So you'll replace, just for five days, that picture of you at Walt Disney World and put it on and, and replace with this. So that every time you get out your phone, here's what it says, pray in a recurring way. First Thessalonians chapter 5, 17, pray without ceasing. And as you look at that for five days, here's what I think, call me crazy. I think just by doing this, every time you look at your phone for the next five days, this will trigger you to pray more in the coming week than maybe you did the last week. And what would happen? What would happen if we prayed more in the second half than we did the first half? Now, this isn't an exhaustive list. And this, I don't even know if you think this is a good list, but the issue or the, the idea here is let's have some prayer triggers, morning, noon, and night, a place, and the cell phone. And 
for extra credit, you might wanna use that cell phone wallpaper beyond just the five days. But what if we just did it for the first week as we head toward the second half of the year? So set up these triggers, set up these times, set up these places and set up what you see. It's an incredible opportunity for you to pray more. Now, if you see all that and you go, okay, I'm gonna set that up, but I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to do when I pray. Great question. In fact, that's actually the question the disciples asked Jesus. How do we pray? So as we talked about how to pray more, here's where we're gonna go next. What to say when we pray. What do you say? How does this work? And one of the best ways to look at this is to really have a conversation that's what this is. You don't have to use flowery words. You don't have to be over-religious. In fact, Jesus talks about that. This is so cool. When the disciples ask Jesus, hey, could you teach us how to pray? This is what Jesus says. In Matthew chapter six, he said this. He said, and by the way, when you pray, there's an assumption here. <laughs> the assumption is, it's not, hey, if you pray or if you decide to do this. No, Jesus is saying, hey, this is vital for a relationship with me. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Well, what are hypocrites? Well, here's what they love to do. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. And so Jesus is saying, hey, guys like me, you know, that stand up and use flowery words and all this kind of stuff, that's cool, that's cool. And you, you shouldn't, you know, there's not anything wrong with praying in public. But here's what I want you to understand about prayer. It's more intimate. It's more personal. It's really kind of a secret thing between you and your heavenly father. So if it's not like this, what is it like? So Jesus goes on. But, and here's this phrase again, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. Let the world, walk away from the world and shut the door and pray to your heavenly father who is in secret. I love this word. And your father who see, sees in secret will reward you. And so what Jesus is saying is that this is a personal thing between you and your heavenly father. This is, in, in secret means that you ha, can have a trusted secret relationship with your heavenly father. Think of it this way. Who is it in your life, if there is a, a deep, dark secret about you, who is it that you would turn to and share that secret with? And what Jesus is saying is, hey, you should have a great friend and you should have a great small group. But how I want you to see your heavenly father is someone that you can share with him what's really going on inside of you. Do that in secret. You, he can, you can bring who you really are. And this is so interesting in the sense that one of the reasons we don't pray a lot is because we've got so much junk in our hearts that we don't think God will listen to our prayers. And what Jesus is saying here is this, hey, he already knows you have junk in your heart. That's why he sent me, you need a savior. People ask me all the time, you think, think God, I can tell God that I'm angry at him because of what's happened or what didn't happen? But I, and the easy response is absolutely, you can tell God you're angry with him. He already knows he's God. He's already figured this out. This won't be a surprise to him. And if you'll bring who you really are and what's really going on, what you're gonna discover is a spiritual principle that's in the scriptures that when you draw near to God, God draws near to you. Now, this verse is really interesting to me because of this room right, or this word right here, room. When we see this word room, it's translated in the New Testament, the Greek language to this, this word. The Greek word for room is timian, which means an inner chamber or a secret room. So the way we've translated this in our world is that maybe there's a place in our house that's kind of a war room. There was a great movie called The War Room. And The War Room is about a room in someone's house where this is where they're gonna pray and go to war and pray. I love that. I think that's great. Nothing wrong with that. What's interesting though, in Hebrew, it doesn't mean this. Here's what this word means. In Hebrew, the prayer room is the prayer shawl or talit. And the prayer shawl, I think, is what Jesus was actually meaning. Not meaning that we shouldn't have a war room or a place at home, but I think the actual translation getting to getting this was a visual thing that everyone in Jesus' culture would understand. And I wanna give you a picture of what a prayer shawl looks like in going in secret to your heavenly Father and praying. 
This is what that looks like. And I think this is actually what Jesus was referencing. It looks like this. This is what Jesus was saying, that take your prayer shawl and go into your secret room and close the door. I think this is what he was meaning because everyone got this analogy. So take your prayer shawl, close out the world and get really personal with your heavenly father. It's an invitation for you to bring you to the relationship. And knowing that it's a, it's a personal conversation with your heavenly father. Once Jesus has set this up, you don't have to be over-religious. You don't have to use religious words. Actually, that's not really the way you bring who you are. Then Jesus says this, knowing all that, pray, pray then like this. And in this moment, Jesus gives us a model to follow called the Lord's Prayer. Now, maybe you were like me. This is back in the, the old days. We actually used to say the Lord's Prayer before we played a basketball game. And it was like, we would say the, the Lord's Prayer and then we would go out and say, let's kill them. So it was an interesting dichotomy there <laughs> between the Lord's Prayer and we're gonna kill them tonight, okay? So many of us can recite the Lord's Prayer. We got it, I got it. I've been there, done that, Jeff. But I want us to see it in a little bit of a different perspective because I don't think Jesus was saying, you've gotta pray these exact words. What Jesus was saying is that there's a pattern here. And this pattern is what I wanna invite you into. You don't have to use religious flowery words. You bring who you are, you close the door, and then this is how you pray. And it's a three-step process in terms of what to say when you pray. It's three steps, I think, as I look at this and study this for our time together. There's the glory, there's the grind, and there's the grace. It's the glory of God, the grind of life, and that doesn't necessarily mean negative, but the, you know, everyday routine and here comes work and here comes school and all that. There's the glory of God, the grind of life, and the grace needed for our relationships. And what Jesus is saying is this is a model for you to follow. So as you set up your prayer triggers, this is something to follow. And so what I wanna, what I wanna do is to walk you through what Jesus said in terms of these three movements, but I think you could take anything in your life and put it within this model, and that's probably, and that's actually the point of what Jesus is saying. You can pray about what's really going on in your life, but one of the best things to do is understand who you're praying to, that's the glory. One of the best things to understand is God's very interested in the grind of life, and what you're gonna need is his grace and grace in your relationships. So let me walk you through what this looks like. The first step is the glory. And the glory of the prayer sounds like this. Our Father in heaven, and let me just stop there. These two words, and especially this word, Father, was a radical, revolutionary way to see and talk to God in this name of Father. And here's why. For, for centuries, the Jewish people, many of them felt like you could not even say the name of God out loud that if you said the name of God out loud, God might just strike you dead. So what they did, they came up with a symbol. And that symbol, they would write the symbol and they would just refer to it. So whenever they were reciting a passage in the Torah, the Old Testament, when it came to the name of God, they would just pass over it because they, they didn't dare say the name of God out loud. Jesus comes on the scene and says, oh, actually, you can say God's name out loud. In fact, I'm giving you a new name to call God because of what I'm gonna do on the cross. You can call him Father, Abba, Papa, Daddy. Wait, 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 wait. You mean God, the creator of the universe, sees me as a son or daughter and I can call him Papa? Yeah, isn't that cool? Isn't that awesome? That's what I'm about to do for you is to bridge the gap between that. Now, for many of us, and I understand this, for many of us, it's hard to see God as a perfect heavenly father because of our earthly father. We didn't have a good relationship with our earthly father. Totally understand that. But what we have to understand is that your God, with all due, all due respect to your earthly father, your heavenly father is a perfect reflection of your earthly father, and because of that, he loves when his kids come to him. Jesus would later say in another passage, your heavenly father loves to give good gifts to those who ask him. So he begins by saying, our father. 
And then he begins to widen the scope. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the first movement of this is for us to come to a point where we do this. We begin to see and express to God how huge and glorious and awesome and mighty he is. This is an important point for us to do, to remind ourselves who exactly it is we're talking to here. This is why I think it's really important, as silly as that example of me as a four-year-old talking to Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, I do think it's important from time to time, maybe not just time to time, maybe more consistently, for us to get outside on a starry night and look up and to go, you actually created all of this, you actually created me, hallowed be your name. And sometimes when we pray in the second half of the year, here's what it should be. When you have your place or you're walking between buildings or you're walking to work, here's what you ought to say. God, you're amazing, you're awesome, you're wonderful, you're, my, you're majestic, you're mighty. In Jesus' name, amen. That's it. All it is was a prayer about the glory of God and it reminds you who it is that's walking with you. So begin by getting a perspective of who this God is and who it is that walks with us, our Father. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's all about you. Then we transition to the grind, the day-to-day -day things that concern us, that worry us. Jesus said it this way, give us this day our daily bread. Now, Jesus isn't saying that you can't pray for anything else other than food, but we have to understand what the context of this was. That many people that Jesus was here, talking to and was hearing this, they weren't sure where their next meal was coming from. So that pressure, that anxiety, that worry, that's what Jesus was addressing. So I think what Jesus is in essence saying here for us is what's, what's on your heart? What's causing you anxiety? What's worrying you? What's bothering you? Bring that to the Father. And bring that to the Father in a constantly recurring way. He already knows what you need. So bring it to him. Students, if you're anxious about the new school year, bring that to him. Teachers, if you're anxious about the new year, bring that to him. Parents, grandparents, leaders, bosses, employees, bring the grind to him. He's excellent at dealing with it. He just wants to know if you want his help. So you've got the glory, you got the grind of life, and then there's the grace. He says this, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, that hey, yes, the great news is that you have received, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, you've received the grace from God, but it doesn't stop here, it flows from here. It flows from the cross, through me, through you, to the people in our lives. So as the grace that has been given to me, let me be distributors of that grace. Not just to the really close people to our lives. Wherever we go, to the coffee barista, to the cleaners, to the ballpark, to the waiters, to the teachers, to the coworkers, let, let us be distributors of that grace that we have received. Let us distribute that. And then lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Will you give me the grace needed to grow me up in those broken places within me so that I will have the grace and the wisdom and the strength not to go down the path of temptation, but deliver me from that. And, and Gwinnett Church has hopefully heard me say this before, but when you soak in the unconditional love and grace of Jesus, it'll grow you up and it will flat mess you up in a really powerful, great way. And so that's what Jesus is inviting us into in this moment, this process, this three-step process of the glory, the grace, the grind the glory of the Father, the grind of daily life, and the grace that we need. Now, here's the, here's the cool thing for all of our churches. What if we did this? <laughs> what if we did this in the second half of the year? What if we brought who we really were? What if we constantly got a reminder, oh, it's noon, you said you were gonna pray about this. 
You walk to these places. Oh, this is what I'm gonna use this time to pray. You're gonna look on your phone. Oh, this is a moment for me to pray in a constantly recurring way. I think this, was, this is a powerful opportunity. It's an amazing invitation. And your heavenly father stands ready for you to invite him into this by having a conversation with him. And you know why he's so excited about this? He loves you. He's for you. He's a wonderful, perfect, heavenly father. You are his idea. He wants your life to work. And that in essence is what we've been talking about in this series. So we're a few minutes away from closing out our halftime and going out into the stadium of life. And before we do, I wanted to recap this series because it's not too late to finish strong, but it's got to start today because halftime is over. And to do that, I wanna just give you a quick recap of this series. We went, like any good halftime, we looked and reflected on the first half and we asked some questions. Week one, we looked at Hebrews chapter 11 and 12 and we said, hey, what habit is hindering me that I need to change in the second half? Have you done that? Have you figured that out? If not, let's get this done. What thought is entangling me that I need to adjust and bring to the light of scripture about who I really am as a son or a daughter of the king? What joy would this change bring me if I can get to the end of the year, help me see through the pain of the change to the joy the change will bring in today how can I fix my eyes on Jesus today? If we ask this question every single day, hey, today, don't worry about yesterday, today, how can I fix my eyes on Jesus? One of the best ways to fix your eyes on Jesus is to pray in a constantly recurring way. Then last week, we talked about one of the most precious gifts that we have. Precious not as in sweet and cute, but precious as in fleeting. It's a resource that is fleeting. You had this last Sunday, you don't have it now. You had this at the first half of the year, it's gone and it's time. Time is going. Time is going. And we said this last week, when it comes to time, the better we spend our time, the better we spend our lives. And we gave you some practical examples of how to do that last week. But I wanna pause and talk to those of you. We heard so many stories because last week we said one of the best ways that you can use this time, when we talked about last Sunday, one of the best ways you can use this time is to stand up and place your faith in Jesus for the very first time. Because this time, this opportunity will be fleeting. And we've heard so many stories about how so many people stood up for the very first time to receive Jesus as their personal savior. And I think all of us need to applaud you for that decision and what you did last week where you stood up and accepted Jesus. And so I think we need to give you a round of applause for what you did last week. That's absolutely amazing. So way to go, way to go. You leverage that time. You say, hey, I may never get this time before. And for those of you at Southside Serenby, I, I just cried when I heard the story of the young lady who's in a wheelchair who raised up in her wheelchair to stand up for Jesus. That story is absolutely phenomenal. And what that means is, is wherever you are and wherever God finds you, he's willing to meet you wherever you are and whoever you may be. So let's use the second half of the year to spend our time on things that ultimately will truly matter and then the question for today is simply this, what would happen? What would happen? What would happen if we prayed more in the second half than we did in the first half? I have an answer for this. But I love what my friend Mark Batterson said. Mark is, a, is the lead pastor at National Community Church in Washington, D.C. And he says this, I love it. He says, when you pray to God in a regular way, irregular things happen. When you pray to God in a regular way, consistently recurring way, irregular things happen. And you go, wow, look how God showed up here. Wow, look, look how God showed up there. What if our heavenly father is just waiting for us to ask him to get involved in these particular areas of life? And here's a wonderful invitation, but it's also a little disturbing sometimes. Jesus says, you have not because you ask not. As for me, I don't want that to be my story. I'm gonna ask and I'm gonna knock on the door and I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna pray. That's my responsibility. 
And God's responsibility is however he chooses to answer that prayer. But as for me, I'm gonna knock on the door. And imagine what might happen if that's our story, going at church. Imagine what would happen if that's your story, Decatur, and Redstone, and Southside. What would happen if we prayed more in the second half than we did the first half? Here's the answer. Let's find out. Let's find out. Because I think your heavenly father is like, oh, you have no idea what I have in store for you if you would pray in a constantly recurring way. This is why, if we'll take this seriously, if we'll set up our prayer triggers and we'll pray the glory, the grind, and the grace, I think we're on the verge of seeing the power of God come closer to us maybe in the second half than he did the first half. If my people will pray. Let's find out. Father, thank you. Thank you for this amazing invitation. Thank you that we can pray because of Jesus and that you hear us through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so as we're on the verge, we're about to release out to the stadium of life and we got the second half of the year before us. Our commitment to you, our wonderful heavenly father, is that we're gonna pray in a constantly recurring way. We're gonna set up some prayer triggers that will remind us, pray, pray, pray. And then we're gonna talk about your glory. We're gonna talk about the things that worry and stress us out and the grind of life and bring that to you. Then we're gonna pray and thank you for the grace that you've given us so that we can be grace distributors so that you grow us up to be the men and women you've called us to be. And we believe when December 31st rolls around, we're gonna look at the second half of the year and go, wow, wow, wow. How big and mighty and personal is our great God. So thanks for what you're gonna do. And we pray all this in the matchless, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, Gwinnett Church, I love you very much. We'll have a great week. Don't forget, next week we begin a brand new series with Andy, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Have a great week.